So I'm, I'm Mary Grossman. I'm the president of the New River Valley chapter and um, of the Virginia Master Naturalists. And I wanna welcome you all. Um, so today, due to the, the great work we had from some of our board members, Mike Schroyer, Bob Glazer, and some others, uh, we've been able to open up this meeting to the general public. And we have some, um, some non-members attending with us. So thank you to everyone who helped that happen and welcome. Welcome to everyone who's here tonight. Um, uh, it's, it's a great time of year to be a naturalist. It's beautiful to be outside. There's so much going on. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit maybe after the speaker about maybe what everyone's been seeing. Um, so the format for tonight's meeting, we'll, uh, we'll do like usual. We'll have our speaker first and then we'll have some club news afterwards and then members have a chance to share um, anything they'd like to talk about and anything they've been seeing locally. So um, yeah, so welcome to everyone. I'm so happy that everyone's here and I'm gonna give it to Barb Glazer to uh, introduce our speaker tonight. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, Professor Keith Hamid. Uh, he's a Virginia Tech researcher and he's with the Department of Fish and Wildlife Conservation and he's studying the uh, climbing behaviors of snakes. Uh, the bio that, uh, that I have for him, thank you. Um, he joined Virginia Tech's Department of Fish and Wildlife Conservation in August of 2019. Much of his research focuses on amphibians, especially Appalachian salamanders, small mammals, and minnows. His research answers questions to provide data-driven foundations for conservation biologists and policymakers. He advocates for experiential learning and work to ensure students always have opportunities to learn by doing. Prior to becoming part of our Hokie Nation, uh, he was a biology professor at Virginia Highlands Community College for 16 years. He was awarded the 2017 State Council of Higher Education in Virginia's Outstanding Faculty Award. He holds a bachelor's degree in biology from Tennessee Technical, Te Technological University, a master's in biology from East Tennessee State University, and a PhD in natural resources from the University of Tennessee. When he's teaching or can, when he's not teaching or conducting research, he likes to spend time with uh, his wife, Misty and daughter, Maddie. And as I said, just a few minutes ago, I've gotten wind that he's the salamander expert guy. Um, and you've been working a lot with the, the people in Grayson County. Is that correct, Kevin? A lot of work on White Top Mountain, yes. Okay, all right. So thank you, Kevin, for being here. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to finally meet this chapter. I worked a lot with the uh, with the Holston River chapter in Southwest Virginia at my previous college. So I'm so excited uh, to be to be with a new chapter. I always loved speaking with master naturalists. It's, it's always fun to have wildlife enthusiasts to get excited about these topics. So um, let's talk about some snakes. I'm going to share my screen with you. And let's see. Are you seeing? Do you see just one slide with a couple of snakes on it? Yes. Perfect, perfect. Um, and, and I'm noticing, um, you know, there are, there, it's always nice to see familiar faces in the audience. And, you know, we're talking about snakes. And uh, one, one neat thing is I see uh, Dr. Don Lindsay in the audience and uh, he wrote the snakes of Virginia too. So um, it's nice to have him there. And um, that, that's a book I've had on, on my shelf for Oh my goodness, 20, 25 years probably. So um, anyway, it's, it's nice to have these resources locally. So let's dive into uh, some of our diversity of snakes that we have. And, you know, I thought let's start out with, with two of my absolute favorites. Um, does anybody recognize the snake on the left, the left of your screen? You can jump in. You don't have to chat. You can unmute yourself if you want to. In, in working with students during this era of Zoom, we've learned that, uh, T talking sometimes is much more exciting than chatting. Does anybody know the one on the left? Looks the like a green snake. snake. That is the rough green snake. And uh, fun story, uh, I would honestly say that that snake is probably one of about 50 factors of why I'm sitting in front of you today talking. But <clears throat> I was very fortunate. Uh, one of my father's best friends growing up was actually ended up being my high school biology teacher. And when I was in kindergarten, 
one of his students brought in a rough green snake and they kept it in the classroom at the end of the school year he brought it to my dad and said i think kevin would like to have this and uh long story short i ended up with a rough green snake uh, uh beyond my mom's demise who was not a big fan of snakes and um that thing i had it uh, until i was a freshman in college when when it when it passed away so uh you know establishing these bonds i think with young people and wildlife is so critical now, and, and I'm thankful that I had opportunities like that when, when I was growing up. So, oh my goodness, so we're going to dive into a little bit of a classroom. You're going to think, oh man, he thinks he's, he's lecturing to his students, and I'm not. But if we actually look up what a reptile is, and, you, and if you look in the dictionary, they're going to tell you that reptiles are ectothermic tetrapods. Oh my goodness, we're already starting with big words. Does anybody want to guess what do you think that means to be ectothermic and to be a tetrapod? Full-blooded, four legs. That's right. You know, and it's uh, <laughs> it, 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 the tetrapods. Pretty easy. They're walking around on land with with four limbs, and the ectothermic. For a lot of us, sometimes when we say cold-blooded, you know, we cringe just a little bit. Reptiles, for the most part, they maintain a pretty constant body temperature, but unlike us, where we do it internally by consuming large amounts of food. They do it by positioning their body in environments that meet the temperature they need to be in. So if a, a timber rattlesnake has had a large meal, it will typically try to put itself in an area where it can be very warm to help speed up that digestion. As the day moves on and it starts getting too warm, it will come out of a warm area and move into some shade to regulate itself. So they do have the ability to regulate their body, but unlike us, they're not doing it internally. And because of that, their caloric demands are much less than, than us. And, you know, when we're thinking of reptiles, uh, you know, these, thank goodness, I guess, I don't know, it would make life exciting if Komodo dragons like this one in the picture were running around Blacksburg. But, you know, we don't have those exciting ones. Okay, now the list for reptiles, the bird people, even the amphibian people, we update our list about every week. The reptile folks, it's normally about every year, and it happens in August. So as of August of this year, would anybody like to take a guess on how many species of reptiles have been described in the world? Wow. So you got to think, you know, we're thinking reptiles, we're talking of lizards and turtles and snakes. Any shots? Somebody's got to have a number. Ten thousand. Okay. Anybody want to go higher than that? Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand. All right. And then we could play the Price Is Right game, and somebody will say one dollar uh, to try to come in low. A little over eleven thousand species. So when you start comparing that to some other vertebrate taxa, it's you know it's pretty interesting. And when we actually dive into the world of, of the reptiles. So we see that the Tuatara, which we're pretty excited, we now have one in our collection of, of Virginia Tech. Um, there's only one species left. Um, this very kind of primitive, almost missing link type reptile. They have a well-developed uh, pineal third eye on top of their head, just really bizarre creatures. Um, there's only one of those. The turtles, we see there's about 360 species. The squamates, which are the lizards and snakes together, make up the bulk of all reptiles, almost 97%. The crocodilians come in at 26%. And then another group, the uh, Amsfavina, the worm lizards, uh, only about 200 of those. And we, that's a group that typically is really not, the average person doesn't often think of those. But for most of us, we're gonna think turtles, snakes, and lizards in Blacksburg. To date, we have no uh, native alligators, no native crocodilians to Virginia. In fact, Virginia is working very hard to make sure they don't get introduced via pets. But, you know, that line is is been fairly constant. But as we're seeing climbing temperatures, that line is probably going to move. And at some point, we very well might start to see uh, Native American alligators establishing themselves in, in southern Virginia. So if we look in Virginia, uh, we can see the vast majority of our uh, reptiles that we have are snakes, 34 species. We've got 20 species of freshwater turtles. And if we throw in our marine species, that adds another five to us. And then we have nine species of lizards. So it makes sense. If we're going to talk reptiles in Virginia, let's, let's talk about snakes. So first of all, uh, that's a picture that I actually took on Price's Fork Road this summer. It's a pretty sad sight. That is a uh, American snapping turtle that has been a common snapping turtle that was hit by a car. 
And if you see uh, what's, can anybody tell what's laying on the asphalt around the turtle? You eggs. see those blobs? Those are eggs. eggs. Those mm -hmm. are eggs. And, and that's the challenge we run into is um, a lot of our rep reptiles are long lived. A lot of them do not reach, especially in the turtle world, they don't start reproducing until they're, they're uh, a very old age. We like to compare them, I do, when we talk about managing things to white-tailed deer, which can, are, you know, extremely successful and can be harvested very easily. We have a great, uh, you know, great resource there. If you took one female snapping turtle and you took one female deer and you looked at all of their offspring down the line, at 20 years, the, the white-tailed deer and all of its offspring would have produced somewhere around 500 more deer. The snapping turtle would have been laying her first clutch of eggs at that point. So that's the challenge we run into. Now, one of the things we see too when we run into study about reptile declines is only about half of all reptiles have been examined. And of those, we see about 20% are threatened. So the problem is we've got more than half of our reptiles. No one really has a good idea as to what's happening. And 20% of those we define as being data deficient, which means we honestly don't know. There is not enough data to show how the population is going. And those are the scary ones because that's sometimes when the extinctions slip up on you because you really didn't have the data to warn you ahead of time that there could be a problem. But when we look at the causes of our reptile declines, it's the same thing we see with amphibians that I also work with. The number one reason is habitat loss. Um, we have overexploitation. Uh, a lot of our turtles are harvested for food. Climate change, which is wrecking havoc, especially on things like turtles, our sea turtles, where um, their sex is actually determined by the temperature that the egg is incubated at. And we're seeing some sea turtle populations now that have shifted about 95, 96% female because of the warm temperatures, which would normally sound great. You know, if you were managing a herd of animals, you would hopefully want that. The problem is we've, we're starting to run out of males now. That's, that's causing problems. Chemical contamination, whether it be heavy metal deposition, whether it be pesticides, diseases, that's a big one we'll talk about with snakes, a new disease called snake fungal disease, which basically acts just like the chytrid fungus in amphibians and it has moved just like white nose syndrome in bats if you're familiar with that. And then the, often the case is these things are occurring synergistically, meaning they're getting hit with habitat loss while they're being exposed to a disease, while they're experiencing drought or warming temperatures due to climate change. So it's kind of a, a double-edged sword for, for a lot of our reptiles. So um, what are their roles? You know, one of the challenge I run into is I actually have my students, one of the questions that I tell them this ahead of time that's going to be on their final exam is they have to construct an argument about the value of snakes. Because in their role as future wildlife professionals, one of the things they're going to hear is there are a lot of people sometimes that don't appreciate snakes. Well, one of the things we see is their ecological role. Snakes eat a lot of things that we don't like, whether it be invertebrates that are consuming our crops, small mammals that are, that are causing damage to your crops or to potentially your home, avian issues. And then they, in turn, are eaten by by bigger things. Uh, allig that's an incredible shot of an alligator. I didn't take that. That red tall hawk that is called a snake and even the bullfrog that's consuming a snake that probably has eaten smaller bullfrogs. They are very valuable and vital links in our food chain. So when you take those out of the, out of the picture, things tend to explode. <clears throat> Can anybody think of a disease that's pretty common when we think of ticks? Lyme's disease. Lyme's disease, right? We, everyone knows it. It's it, all of us. We're all we all enjoy nature, but in the back of our minds, all of us have to worry a little bit every time we're out. You know, is today the day that the tick could potentially bite me? So, what a lot of people don't realize with Lyme's disease is that that tick is on an intermediate host before it comes to you, and that's typically a small mammal, something like a mouse, something like a shrew, a mole. When you remove snakes from the equation, as in Northern Virginia. When we had that rapid development, a lot of agricultural land was quickly turned into subdivisions. Snakes did not persist very well in the environment, often because of people. The number of small mammals go up, which means the number of ticks go up, which means your chance of getting Lyme's disease increases by 10 times, not 10%, 10 times when you remove snakes from the equation. So one, one very valuable uh, reason to have snakes around is they're helping us control the small mammals, which help, uh, help then control the Lyme's disease. 
And how about this shot? I wish I could take credit for this one as well. Uh, this is from, I don't know how many folks were privileged to see the film. Was it last fall when they had Hidden Waters and they yes. showed? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so the, these are the same folks. What an incredible shot of a hellbender taking a, uh, a northern water snake. So again, you know, they're moving those calories through the food chains uh, pretty rapidly. So, uh, you know, I always, I always like to joke, and I should be sharing, I think I could, I hope you're able to hear some sound. If you don't, you can let me know. Are you hearing some sounds? Yes or no? No. Yeah. Okay. No sound. Well, that's not good, because I've got a couple of videos for us tonight. So I didn't click the right button. So let's try this one more time. How about now? Yes. All right. Oh, so wait, wait. Yes. Yes. snakes so from the classic line in raiders of the lost ark and john williams music just plays it in perfectly you know harrison ford said snakes why does it have to be snakes and we run into this um literally of all the tax that you can study the response you get from most people right um if you study freshwater fish most people are somewhat indifferent but when you start mentioning snakes things get exciting this is one of my uh, students at my previous college we're in the longleaf pine forest uh, in coastal Mississippi, and there's a, uh, a black racer. And one of the things I see in, in a lot of experience before I, I began my career in academia, I managed to park and worked in a nature center. And in that, we did a lot of programming with a lot of children, and it was extremely rare to ever find a young child, a four or five year old, that was truly afraid of snakes. It is a learned behavior that we see. And just like the reaction of Hannah in this picture, most, most people, when they actually get involved and get hands on with these animals, even if there was a fear at some point in your life, it's pretty easy to get over that fear. Now, these pictures are out of a series of books um, that were done by the University of Georgia. They did the surveys for this. And so they're a little grainy because I scanned them out. But I think it's awesome. A little human dimension work here. They asked people, they did a survey of just average people, and they said, what are your thoughts? What are your, you know, do you have an attraction? Are you neutral? Do you have fear? And they went through some of the different groups of reptiles. And as you could see, the vast majority of people, when they were asked about lizards, they said, oh, we really don't care. I mean, we're not afraid of lizards. We don't really like lizards. They're just kind of here, and we try not to step on them. No big deal. My cat gets them occasionally, you know, that kind of a deal. And then they said, what do you think about turtles? I always give our students a hard time that work with turtles because most people love turtles. There's an extreme attraction there. People think they're cute. We Some interesting work out of Clemson, though, shows that young people actually try to hit them with cars nowadays, which is interesting. But um, the average person, there's not much of a problem when it comes to turtles. So what happens when we look at snakes? And this is where our world, for those of us who work with snakes, get interesting. What you see is the vast majority of people either love snakes or they hate snakes. There is no neutral. Um, it's, it's kind of a, along with our world today where everybody's kind of, kind of it's a, you know, very divided and very, uh, very bipolar, all these things. So what we see is when we're trying to manage these species, we have people that love them to death, that want to help them, and sometimes overly help them. And then we have people that think that truly the only good snake um, is a dead snake, which, which is a problem for us. So one of the things I often do now in a master naturalist group, you know, I don't have to do this. And actually, you can't see this because I have this awesome background behind me of White Top Mountain. But literally at my feet right now is my 95 pound Bernese mountain dog. So I love dogs. But one of the things I always say this to get people's attention is I'll say, you know what? I'm with you. The only good dog is a dead dog. And boy, you can get the room fired up that way, right? And then people will always tell you the stories about how they swerve out of their way to hit the snakes on the side of the road. Well, then you say, you know what? I do the same thing with dogs. They're in somebody's yard. I just drive up and get them. Or if you really want to get the crowd fired up, you mention horses. <laughs> and you say, the only good horse is a dead horse. Oh, listen, you see what happens when you hit one with a car. I take my hoe, my shovel, and I just go chase them around the field, and I just keep hitting the horse until it drops. And what I hope to see from that is most people then go, 
okay, I kind of see where you're going from. I don't necessarily like snakes, but I understand where you're going. And it's an irrational fear. Now, one of the problems we have is when you try to rational with someone who's irrational, it's hard to do. Real quick, you can play along. I've got some data from Texas and then some data from the U.S. Does anybody want to take a guess in the state of Texas on average every year, how many people unfortunately lose their lives due to automobiles? Mm -mm. Anybody want to take a shot? 15,000. It's, it's sad. Up, up almost 4,000. What about in the United States? If we look at the whole U.S., how many people die from cars? 50,000. We don't want to think it, but almost 38,000, right? What about drownings in the state of Texas? It's a coastal state. 600. A little over 200 a year. What about lightning in Texas? 50. Six, right? What about lightning in the U.S.? Now, this is where the state of Florida, right? The state of Florida is the worst place on the planet to be when it comes from being hit by lightning. Anybody want to take a shot for you know, lightning deaths? 150. About 54. Right. Um, venomous arthropods. So that, you know, in Texas, that brings on a whole new meaning of scorpions and some other fun things. Four. Here's one we don't think about. I'm, I have an allergy to bees, so I'm, I'm kind of aware of this. But 53 people die in the U.S. every year to, um, to bees. What about dogs? The thing that's sitting at my feet right now that I, I love to death, 21 people in our country die every year from dogs. In the state of Texas, anybody want to take a guess about snakes? Oh, boy. Four. One, One. on average a year. A year. <laughs> and then when you think about the U.S. Must be the same about six people a year. Now, I don't have time to get into bicycles and all these other bizarre things like ladders, horses. Horses kill a lot of, believe it or not, right? But the problem is there is this irrational fear of snakes. And uh, there's no way we're gonna change everyone's mind, but by educating people, it helps. Now, the problem is, right, what we often see are things like this. Right. This is a timber rattlesnake from Clinch Mountain that we were working with, and I would used my snake hook to pull out the thing so we could get a good picture of it. And then we see what happens when people get bitten and the swelling, the necrosis, literally your skin begins to swell to the point that it will sometimes actually rip due to the, the fluid accumulation. Uh, you know, something like a copperhead, most people are going to be okay. Uh, what we do know is actually in Tennessee, there was a death just a few years ago. Someone actually had an allergic reaction to a copperhead bite, which had not been seen before. So it was basically they went into anaphylactic shock. So it wasn't the venom itself. Most full grown adults are going to be okay with a copperhead. You're not going to feel great. You're going to be pretty nauseous and you're going to regret being bitten. Rattlesnakes are a different story. You're going to need some help and you're going to need some medical help pretty quickly. I could tell you, uh, and again, I'm not trying to paint an unrealistic picture. Um, we try to conserve snakes, but at the same time, we have to be careful. A great friend of mine in Middle Tennessee, who's in a university there, who's worked with rattlesnakes for 25 years, putting transmitters in them and tracking them each season, had handled this one snake many, many years. They keep them in big tubes, clear plastic tubes, so they can't turn around and, and get you, and uh, you become complacent. And he had a bad day. The snake slipped out of the tube. The rattlesnake, a large male, got him on his index finger. I'll skip all the details. Uh, a helicopter flight to Vanderbilt uh, Hospital, three doses of antivenom, a medical bill of over $100,000, and three years later, all the movement that he has in his index finger is that. I don't know if you can even see my finger moving. That's all he's got. So it can be bad, but the chance of it being bad is very slim. The, the majority <laughs> of people who are bitten in this country by snakes are bitten how? Does anybody know? I, I shouldn't laugh, but it's, it's, I find it to be a little funny. Picking up the snake, no doubt. You would think that's, that's number two. Number one is they're trying to kill it. Uh -huh. And in, in the pro they see it's venomous and say, okay, we're going to kill this thing. And in the process of trying to kill it, they, um, they end up getting bit themselves. So uh, that's kind of, you know, leave them alone. All right. One of the things we start talking about identifying snakes, that if you look in a lot of your field guides, you're going to see there's two different types of scales. And one of those is a smooth scale and the other is a keeled scale. And literally what that means on a smooth snake, if you rub your finger across it, it's going to feel very smooth. And on the keeled snake, each of its scales are going to have a raised area. 
like knife edge kind of appearance, almost like the bottom, the keel of a sailboat where the scale sticks up. So that's kind of a, a, a good diagnostic tool that's going to help us when we dive into our world of, of snakes. So some other fun things about snakes. One of the things we don't know a lot about the reproduction. Uh, there are very few field observations about this. We do know that snakes uh, uh, worldwide, that females often will produce some pheromones and the males are actually able to track them down. One of the ways they're trying to battle Burmese pythons in the Everglades is to actually use pheromones from female Burmese pythons to lure the males into where they could trap them. But the other fun thing is males, especially things like our timber rattlesnakes, do combat. Now, it's not combat like you would think where they're beating each other up. If you've ever had a kid that played thumb wars, right? If you ever did thumb wars, that's literally what they do. They try to pin the other snake down. So I've got a quick video and you can see uh, these male rattlesnakes. And I could turn the volume down so we don't, there's no real good sound. But you can see the two males are there and their job, their goal, what they're trying to do is to pin the other one down. They don't hurt each other. They don't bite each other. It's literally to establish dominance to, to mate with the female in that particular area. And they will take the female, you could see, or they take the male, the one just did it. He's pinned the one down to the ground. And at that point, he's the victor. And the other one literally will, will crawl away. Now, the other thing that's kind of interesting with, with snakes is the males can't keep their reproductive structures inside of them. Uh, the hemi pings only come out when they're ready to reproduce. And so it's, it's hard to, to determine the sex of a snake in the field sometimes. And when they do mate, sometimes, especially in the water snakes, you will find mass congregations of these snakes mating. And I, I always find this funny because, you know, when the news media gets involved with snakes, sometimes it gets interesting. So here's a fun little news clip uh, about a greenway not very far from us in Charlotte, North Carolina. When some folks. An alarming sight along a popular Charlotte Greenway. Look at this. A viewer sent us these pictures of what looked like a writhing ball of snakes. NBC Charlotte's Xavier Walton spoke with the woman who snapped these photos. He joins us live. Xavier, it looks like she got pretty close to take photos like that. Pretty close, a little too close for comfort, if, if you ask me. The photo was taken here at this part of the Little Sugar Creek Greenway. We spoke to that woman tonight. She had to take a picture because she almost couldn't believe what she was seeing. You know, the first thing I did was pull up my phone and took a picture. Christine Prophet is all smiles now, but in the heat of the moment. I was pretty terrified. She runs this path on the Little Sugar Creek Greenway with her dog just about every day. Four or five snakes every time, but I've never seen, you know, 10 to 20 all balled up like that. What she saw was so unbelievable, she just had to snap a snake pic. No one's going to believe me if... I didn't take a picture of it, so Pixar didn't happen. Animal experts say snake season is heating up, and like the temperature, sightings are on the rise. This water snake was seen along the four mile. So you could see again, uh, people get excited, right, uh, when they see that, and uh, it, it draws a lot of attention. And in the Great Lakes area, you can have uh, water snakes and, and garter snakes. They form mass congregations. Interesting. So along the lines of reproduction, too, something is kind of interesting. Thank you. So um, snakes can lay eggs, right? And then they can also um, give, um, give birth to live young. But one of the things we're seeing with snakes now, especially a lot of our venomous snakes, is not only are they retaining the egg as we originally thought they did, but they, there is actually a very primitive placenta-like structure that allows the female to provide nourishment in, a different, in, an, in addition to the egg yolk that's there. So it's a really cool, I was help some folks that, that ran that study. So that makes them a little mammal-like. Now they're not mammals, but it makes them mammal-like in the sense that the female is able to provide nourishment um, to that developing um, embryo. And what a lot of people don't realize is our venomous snakes, uh, in addition to some of our others, but rattlesnakes, for instance, here's a, here's a very quick image that shows you they are not laying eggs. Uh, they uh, are producing live young. And with rattlesnakes, those young will then hang out with mom for several weeks, uh, learn to bask with her, kind of hang out in these areas, we basically nurturing areas. Uh, and the female uh, will typically select these rock outcrops because they are so very warm uh, for the young to continue to kind of develop after uh, she's given birth to them. So yeah, it's, it's not what you would think of as the rat snake that's, that's laying eggs. So what do you think, are, are there any advantages to that? Why would you want to keep the eggs inside of you and and 
you know, provide some nutrients for them. Any thoughts? Really some of them will make it to adulthood. It, greater protection. The other thing is you mentioned early on, someone said they're ectothermic, right? What do you think, what would be the advantage there if you're carrying the eggs with you? As opposed to leaving them in a mulch pile in someone's backyard. You can regulate the temperature. That's exactly right. So in essence, you can control potentially even speed up their development by keeping them warm more. And we see that with rattlesnakes, for instance. The females will often hang out in these rock outcrops, uh, especially uh, towards the end of the gestation period to help increase that body temperature and make them speed up. And we're gonna talk about a conservation of, of a king snake. And uh, we're gonna show you another thing that has to do with the non-native species too, that's an advantage. So let's dive into some of the snake diversity that we have uh, in Virginia. So the family uh, Colubridae, which um, is, this is a, a very, very large family. Um, and I would expect, a lot of us expect that the taxonomy of this is probably going to change at some point. Uh, worldwide, there's almost 2,000 species. 31 of our Virginia snakes uh, belong uh, to this particular family. So it's huge. Two thirds of all the snakes in the world belong to it. And we actually find members of this family everywhere on the planet except Antarctica, so all of our continents. So our eastern worm snake, Carophus aminus. And so, uh, it's always interesting to look at the meanings of this. It actually means a straw snake that's pleasing. And the pleasing has to do with its kind of color. It's almost got this uh, pinkish color to it. It gets the name straw snake because it's long and thin and it's tiny. It only gets to be about 15 inches long and that's a really large one. They love worms. So you're gonna find them hanging out under you know, wood piles. Uh, uh, we find them under pieces of, of uh, plywood that maybe has been laid out, old carpet. If you ever find a spot where someone on a roadside dump has thrown carpet that's been there for several years, you can often pick up those pieces of carpet sometimes and find worm snakes. Um, we don't see them that often though because they spend the majority of their life underground. Now, this is really hard as we often do in herpetology. You may want to guess, what do you think worm snakes eat? Earthworms. Earthworms, right? All of us as, as young people, and, and some of us today, right? That someone said the best herpetologists are the kids that never grow up, and my wife would probably agree to that. One of the things, if you're trying to catch worms, they're sometimes hard to hold on to. So one of the fun things about the worm snake is that its tail actually has, it comes to a very tip, almost like a spine. And it will actually use that to kind of pin the worm down and then come around with its head and be able to start consuming the worm. So it's got a little spike on its tail. And these are egg layers. They don't lay in many eggs. They're very tiny eggs too that, that they lay. So be on the lookout. That's a good one actually. There are a lot of places in Virginia that we still lack county records for that snake. And it's just a matter of people um, you know, not flipping things on the ground and, and looking for them. All right, so our rough green snake that we mentioned before, Ophedrus estivus. Um, it actually means the snake of the woods and uh, estivus means of the summer because you often see them in the summer. They, uh, they're this, this greenish yellow color. We, love, we often find them a lot in riparian zones. So areas around streams. Now their numbers had been declining. Um, now what's interesting is in the last two years in the Southeast, we've seen an increase in observations. What we don't know is media now that we have platforms like Facebook, does it allow people to make their observations known more things like iNaturalist uh, or are the snakes truly beginning to have a resurgence? In fact, just recently someone reported they were digging into, this was last week um, in I believe South Carolina, they were digging into a bank along a, a creek for some reason and they found an area where they had started to den. I think there were 16 or 17 rough green snakes in a, in a little cavity into this bank area. Um, they love to eat insects. They're egg layers. They could get to be, a, be about three feet long. Anybody want to think if they're an insect eater, some of you I know are really into birds and we're seeing some potential declines in things like shrikes and kestrels, that some of that's habitat, but some of it maybe is the same cause. Any potential problems if their diet is mainly insect-based? Anything we do to kill the insects. There we go, right? And we know insect numbers are beginning to decline. We also see that a lot of these chemicals pass through the food chain. So one of the things we kind of want to investigate down the road in, in, with these snakes is, are they harboring uh, body tissue 
concentrations of some of these uh, insecticides that potentially could be uh, impacting them in some way. We don't know for sure. It could just be strictly a, a loss of habitat and a loss of the food that's in those habitats as well. The ringneck snake, I bet most people on, on our uh, meeting tonight have seen her. How many people, has everybody seen a ringneck at some point? Love ringnecks, right? Diadophus punctatus. Diadophus actually means the crowned snake, and it gets that the ring around its neck. Their their ventral surface can be anywhere from a yellowish to an orangish color. And one of the fun things is when you find some that have just hatched. There's a picture uh, of in in someone's hand. The park I used to manage, we would get them. They literally look like little tiny worms. They're the, the neatest things. Their diet is often worms. They love salamanders. They love salamander eggs. They'll even take small lizards. They have a saliva that they, they will paralyze their prey. Now, one, a ringneck snake is never going to bite you. And as soon as I say that, someone will send me a picture saying, you know, one nipped me. And if it does, it's not going to stay on at all. But uh, to an earthworm or a salamander, that saliva helps to paralyze them and keeps them from being able to potentially escape. Uh, this is a common, this is a suburban snake as well as a forested snake. So many of you in your suburban backyards, if you live uh, e even in Blacksburg, uh, right around the town, you probably have um, ringneck snakes hanging around your backyard. Okay, all right, so our king snakes, uh, Lampropeltus gutula. And the gutula actually means, um, it, it ties into uh, a Moroccan culture that used to weigh, weave a lot of fabrics out of metal, so it has a very chain-like appearance, and its name actually means a shiny shield. King snakes uh, are awesome, and they get that name because they are the king of all snakes. They will consume other snakes. They especially love to consume venomous snakes. Most king snakes are immune to our venomous species, so our rattlesnakes, uh, the cottonmouth, and the copperhead they could take. They lay eggs. Uh, which is going to be a problem for them. They could get to be about 64 inches long. Now, this is an animal that we've seen major declines in, especially in places like South Carolina and Georgia. There are places in South Carolina now where you can no longer find king snakes. Anybody want to take a guess what their favorite food is? We said they like to eat venomous snakes. You want to take a guess which one? Copperheads. They love copperheads. Um, I often joke and I say, you know, if I, back in our day before COVID, if I brought a, a bunch of pizzas into Cheatham Hall, uh, the students would come running and that's kind of the way king snakes are with copperheads. They love to eat them. So when people begin to realize there was a problem is the number of copperheads in certain areas of South Carolina shot up through the roof. Uh, a five, eight, almost 10 times increase in the number of snakes, not percent, but 10 times increase in some areas. And they begin to look and they saw almost no king snakes. And the, the assumption was that people were taking them as for pets. That's that over-exploitation. They make great, great pets. People love them. There's a big market for them. But when people went back and looked at their data, researchers, they realized that wasn't probably the case. They quit seeing young king snakes about 15 to 20 years ago. And what happened is the population aged and aged and aged. The older individuals died, and there was nothing taking their place. So the problem became is what was happening to their eggs that was not happening to the copperhead. Remember, the copperhead doesn't lay eggs. It gives live birth. Do you might want to take a shot what the problem was in Georgia and South Carolina with king snake eggs? DDT? No, you would think maybe a human. We, we did this, but it's not going to be something you would think that we did. Hmm. Not a chemical. Climate change? <laughs> You would think climate change, not it is impact. eating king snake eggs. Oh, maybe no. That would be an interesting reversal of fortune, though, wouldn't it? Right. <laughs> you're, I will tell you, you're onto it when you said something eating their eggs. Raccoons. Mm. Raccoons. Think small. Think they're not supposed eggs. to be here. Really small. House mouse. Really small, and they hurt. Ants. Fire ants. Our non-native fire ants. They can get through the egg membrane and they destroy the embryo. And the fire ants are even attacking alligator nests. Um, for whatever reason, they especially went after um, king snakes. And we have fire ants. Have I was just talking to a professor I still work with at the University of Tennessee. Um, he did a controlled burn 
in an area in front of his home just a couple of weeks ago, and he had 16 fire ant mounds in Knoxville, Tennessee. Now, they uh, they are quickly invading from the from the southwest, and uh, they they will be in Blacksburg eventually. So be wow. not you know not not tomorrow and not next year, but uh, in a window of when we're looking at things, they're going to be here. So uh, we're worried about our salamanders when they get here. Um, we're also worried about armadillos too, um, as they're quickly uh, advancing as well. But that's a huge problem with king snake. So you pull the the predator out, and their prey, in this case, the copperheads, have exploded. Just to show you, again, always always kind of the gross stuff for this, but. Uh, there's some awesome video that someone shot. I did not take that, but you could see the king snake, and it has a uh, has a copperhead that is in the process of of taking down. This is a very long video. We won't watch all of it, but um, you could see it feeding on the copperhead. And again, they do that very efficiently. Okay, uh, our um, milk snake. Triangulum talks about the fact it's got this Y kind of V shape on top of its head. They also can deal with pit viper venom a little bit. We see them a lot of in old barns. Um, they could get old, almost three and a half feet long. Unfortunately, this is a snake that is often misidentified for copperheads and is persecuted there. The fun thing about this one, this is one of the few snakes that I find at the high elevations of White Top Mountain. Uh, this snake actually is, we've documented as high as about 47, 4,600 feet on White Top, Virginia's second tallest mountain. So it does fairly well with, with high elevation areas. And uh, this is one that some of you could be seeing in, um, in your backyards, even in, in Blacksburg, especially to the more rural areas. Okay, our Scarlet King Snake, believe it or not, we have a location about 50 minutes from here. There's a power line cut where there are Scarlet King Snakes and unfortunately every, every recreational hurt person goes to, it's kind of like when you get a really good spot for a bird and everybody goes and goes and goes. And some of these King Snakes were beginning to wor be worried about the fact that people are in that power line flipping rocks almost weekend, every weekend to see them. Um, the Elapsoides there is talking, it actually means coral. And so these are mimics to our coral snake, which is a picture on the bottom left. And the, the thing we would often, you know, teach young people is uh, red on black is a friend of Jack. So you can see on our scarlet king snakes, the red is touching the black band. And red on yellow is the dead fellow. And in the coral snakes, uh, the red is touching the yellow. Now in the state of Virginia, we don't have coral snakes to worry about. Um, and, but we do find the scarlet king snakes. Typically, they're more abundant where the coral snakes are. The mimicry helps there. There's not a lot to reinforce the mimicry here. Uh, they are a predator of, of lizards. They love, they'll take rodents too, but they really do well a little farther south where there are more, um, more lizards to prey on. Okay, um, one of my all-time favorites, uh, I, I've had one of these that I've used for interpretation. It actually is sitting in my office right now. It is about 21 years old and has probably been held by about seven to 8,000 young kids over the course of its life. The corn snake, uh, Pantherophus guttata. Guttata means it's spotted belly. The other thing is when you see the pan, what do you mean? It actually means bread. And you're thinking bread. Their body shape, they're kind of flat on the bottom and then their sides go up and they're curved on top almost like the cross section of a, of a loaf of bread uh, is kind of the way to think about that. Very uh, um, uh, harmless snakes. I tell people these are the golden retrievers of the snake world. They will not hurt. That's why we use them for interpretation. Uh, even wild ones that maybe never been held by a person, you can go pick one up in the field and, and nothing happens. They also are persecuted because of their resemblance potentially to a copperhead. Um, they often spend a lot of time undergrounds. In midsummer, they'll go up and start uh, becoming an uh, avian predator up in the trees. The, but again, this is one we've seen a decline in, par partially because they're being taken for pets and partially because of um, their resemblance to copperheads, unfortunately. Keep an eye out for that one. Our eastern rat snake, everybody's seen the rat snakes. Um, Pantherophus alleghenyensis, talked about the Allegheny Mountains. They're amazing climbers, as we're going to talk about. They love to eat birds. They, they get the name rat snake, which is, which is great. They eat small mammals, but their favorite food, their pizza, is actually birds. And, you know, a lot of us herpetologists will joke with the bird community when people put out bluebird boxes, uh, which we love. 
uh, but we often joke and call them snake feeders, right? Because uh, rat snakes find that all the bird people get mad. Uh, you know, we like bluebirds, but um, rat snakes love to find um, bird boxes and they are very effective at going in there and, and removing the birds from those. They can get it to be 80 inches long. So one of our largest snakes in length uh, they can have five to 19 eggs. And actually there's some examples where they can greatly exceed that. Some females can. This is one that if you do have a pile of mulch in your yard early in the summer, uh, midsummer, you potentially could expect some rat snake um, eggs. And I could tell you from our research project we did this summer, uh, we found rat snakes in many neighborhoods uh, in, in Blacksburg. So um, you know, that's one that's harmless. It's not gonna hurt you, but people get excited when a big snake like that comes crawling into their garage. When they're young, they have a totally different appearance. They have a gray body with kind of the dark, dark gray bands on them. And a lot of people will uh, confuse that and think, oh my goodness, I'm seeing a you know, young copperhead. And young copperheads are gonna have a bright yellow tip on their tail. Um, and these can get a little striky, even though they're not gonna bite you. And that also doesn't help them. A lot of people will, um, will unfortunately kill those and they send me pictures saying what have I just killed and I'm like oh why did you do that so they might, the other thing that we're starting to see with from a, I think that's impacting the population of these has anybody heard of this things people put around their homes for pests and these young rat snakes glue traps you seen the glue traps that people use these things, when they're young, are eating insects, a lot of insects. And, um, you know, the glue traps are put down to catch mice or to catch insects. And they are incredibly good at catching um, snakes, too, especially these young rat snakes. So uh, a lot of the wildlife rehabilitators will tell you you can use um, uh, almost a, uh, oh, man, I just blanked it out, not a vinegar. It's um, it's an oil, uh, uh, um, uh, corn oil, uh, the like m the cooking oils. And uh, that, that will help get them off without doing a lot of damage. If you try to rip one off, you end up ripping the skin and that's, that's a, a lethal thing for them. So if you can avoid the glue traps, that's, that's a, kind of a bad thing for, for our young snakes. So uh, when, I, when you asked me to talk, you said we saw in the paper some of the stuff we did. We had, a, we had a fun summer project that involved a couple of our undergraduates. And one of the things, as you mentioned in my introduction, I'm really excited about getting students involved and experiential learning, hands-on learning. So we had a great opportunity for a couple of undergraduates this summer. We were approached by a company that makes products for the uh, utility industry. And one of the things that's beginning to happen is snakes are causing power outages. And we all know squirrels, they get up in the, in the transformers, they get up to the power lines, it's a bad day for the squirrel. And it's even worse for the power customers that lose their power. When we started to investigate this, um, you start to see that there are outages. I just pulled this one off uh, just from May for you to see uh, throughout the Southeast, especially um, in coastal areas of Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, where um, snakes are the responsible for the power outage. Uh, a federal study just said animals, they said squirrels, but the actual study said wildlife is actually a greater threat to power distribution in this country than um, bio or than uh, terrorists are. Um, so, which was kind of interesting. And this is a picture of a rat snake that unfortunately did not make it. That was taken, uh, I believe, in Kentucky uh, from um, a, a transformer where it had climbed into the transformer and the process shorted everything out, electrocuted the snake. So it's bad for the snake and it's bad for the people. Um, why are they climbing? They're going after the birds. The bird nests that are up there, studies have shown that the rat snakes actually can smell the bird feces on the, uh, on the utility pole. And that's what prompts them to go climbing because they know the birds are up there in the, in the bird nest. So we did some um, trials. I can't show you the product because it's, it's proprietary with the company that we were testing it for. But one of the things we did is we studied how uh, rat snakes climbed utility poles. And these are some of our videos from our facility at Center Woods. And this is our control pole. And what you notice is this pole had a crack in it, a wooden utility pole. And the rat snake finds that crack very quickly and within a matter of seconds is able to exploit that crack and move right up the pole. Um, so basically any type of rough surface, brick homes, uh, rough bark of an oak tree, you would be shocked how little it takes for them to be able to uh, grab traction and be able to move up utility poles. So we were trying to, to work on, a, again, to test this product for this particular company. Uh, for the simple fact, we know that people need um, they need their electricity to work. 
because they might have life-saving devices, medical devices, and as a conservation tool. You know, we won't, don't want the snakes. The snakes are valuable, and we don't want them to be lost being um, electrocuted too, too. So it's kind of a win-win for us. All right, another one that gets a really, really bad rep is our black racer, which actually it's the colubra constrictor. It actually means the constricting snake. One of the things that hurts it is it, 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 people that might kind of think it looks like a rat snake. It's got a really large eye and it's got this scale that kind of looks like it's snarling. It almost looks like it's got its eyebrows raised the way its scale is. So it, it looks a little sinister maybe. They are extremely fast and their defense is to run from you. So the misnomer, the kind of the old tale that got passed down is that black racers will chase you. And what happens is a bunch of people would corner a racer maybe trying to kill it and its defense is its speed so it just takes off well the person that it took off towards makes the assumption that it's chasing that person so what does that person do it takes off running the snake is not the snake is trying to get out of dodge and it's, it's just going as fast as it can the appearance to the observer is that it was chasing the person that was running so i can assure you they don't chase you right they do strike they're very bitey uh they are a very uh kind of aggressive snake I had a call uh, this summer off Bishop Road, Bishop Lane in Blacksburg that someone thought they had a really large rat snake and we were all excited and, and it was a large uh, black racer that, that happened to be there. But that big eye in comparison to the head, the other thing, the rat snakes are going to have a white ventral surface, a white belly. The racer just is going to have white underneath, um, underneath its throat, but they are fast and they are hard to catch too because of their speed. Okay, this is one I guess of all my snakes right now I'm most excited about the pine snake. Uh, Pituophis melanolucus. The Pituophis actually means pine snake and melanolucus means um, the white and, and black, talking about its coloration. The last observation of a pine snake in the state of Virginia was in 1989. I don't know if anyone has visited. Has anyone been to a place near Fentwick Mines? Anybody been to that area? Yes, you know, yes, yes. Really neat area. That was the last place they were observed. Um, one of the problems that they run into is they love to burrow. They love these kind of sandy soils that, like we see at Fentway. They love old stumps to get in, and they actually will communally den. So they might have four or five females coming and laying their eggs in one spot. When they get threatened, they vibrate their tail in dry leaves that sounds a little rattle-like. Rat snakes will do that too. And the other problem is they hiss and they hiss very loudly. And the average person who's already weird about snakes and they corner this thing and it starts hissing at them and it starts shaking its tail like a rattlesnake, you can guess what the outcome of that is. And it's not good. This is one of our largest snakes, not in length, but in girth for a non-venomous snake. And again, we don't know a lot about their status right now. This, I'm gonna turn up the volume on this one. See if you can hear it. You can hear its tail. Did you hear that hiss? Yes. Could you hear that? Let's be, it, it does it one more time. So could you see that someone that was a little nervous about snakes anyway, this thing is shaking its tail rattling and makes that noise what happens to it. So I'm pretty excited. Uh, we are gonna be working with the state of Virginia with the Department of Wildlife Resources, the US Forest Service. We've been given a grant again to help fund some of our undergraduate students. Uh, we're getting ready to waiting on the final contract that literally should be here any day now. We're gonna start a project to look for pine snakes in the state of Virginia. Again, a 30 year absence, uh, we feel certain we have a new method to catch them. Some colleagues of mine, uh, Josh Campbell with the Tennessee uh, Wildlife Resource Agency. Uh, I don't know if anybody is a college football fan. You might recognize Josh. Actually, you probably don't I always give him a hard time. He's another fellow Vol. He, uh, he was actually on the University of Football Tennessee, uh, University of Tennessee football team that went to the national championship. So we always give Josh a hard time. He is uh, an incredible wildlife biologist for the state of Tennessee. They implemented a new survey method that's been used in other southern states. And it basically involves a drift fence, which we normally use to catch reptiles and amphibians. But instead of them falling into a bucket, they pass through this bucket on the end. This is Josh with two of his uh, summer staff. And the snake crawls through the bucket and there's a trail camera inside the bucket to get a video. And what I'm gonna show you in the lower right, 
that is a pine snake crawling through a bucket in August of 2019, um, which is a time of year they should not be moving. They found a new population in Middle Tennessee, uh, about 100 kilometers from the nearest population node. We're going to be implementing this this summer at Fentwick Mines. We're really excited. The other thing we're going to be doing, and this is just our draft, and I promise you as soon as we get it, our fl flyer finalized, our website finalized, we're going to be talking to master naturalists and ask for your help. We've had really good luck in the state of Virginia with mountain chorus frogs and green salamanders, asking nature enthusiasts just like yourselves to help us out. We think people are seeing pine snakes and they just don't realize what they're seeing. Uh, in the state of Georgia, they had a similar decline and no one would report pine snakes. And then they realized the local word in southern in areas of Georgia was not a pine snake. Nobody knew them as they knew them as bull snakes. So the state of Georgia totally reframed their citizen science approach and said, let us know when you see a bull snake and their phone started ringing like crazy. People were seeing them. They just didn't know them as a pine snake. They knew them as bull snakes in Georgia. We think there are people probably hiking along the AT, people doing outdoor activities, folks deer hunting, um, folks that are you know bird watching, that are fishing, that maybe are running into pine snakes and they could help us out with this. And again, we're gonna be running our own surveys too. So as soon as we get our flyer printed, uh, I would appreciate, we would always love to have your help in, as well in getting these flyers out to people. And, and if you would ever like to do a field trip uh, to Fentwick Mines, we can arrange that. And it is interesting habitat for this part of Virginia. It's really, really bizarre with the vegetation that's growing there too. Uh, so we hope to be able to, to find pine snakes there. Another resident of our um, of our kind of sandy areas, the eastern hognose snake, Heterodon plantirhinos. It actually means different tooth and and funny shaped nose. Basically, these things are gorgeous. One of the students we're going to be working with, uh, one of our students who's incredible, a little herpetologist, Sam Van Oy, does a great job. Got a picture of, of the one on the upper left just a few weeks ago for us at Fentwick Mines. These things flatten their heads. To, to make their heads look very broad. They are toad specialists. They love toads. And they are rear fang, meaning their fangs go backwards in the back of their mouth. And they are mildly venomous. But the problem is, unlike a copperhead that has to pop you and you're envenomated, where their fangs are in their back, they have to grab you and chew on you. Literally, they'll sit there and chew on their prey. Uh, so they have to have contact time for a long time. So if one were to bite you, you just take it off of you and you're safe. You don't want to let it sit there for four or five minutes and chew on you. But they come in all kinds of colors. They're very beautiful. The other fun thing that hognose snakes do is when you really annoy them, and I could turn this down. Well, you can hear it. It'll hiss a little bit. You can see how it flattens its head, shakes its tail. The Appalachian name for this is the puff adder. Uh, a lot of folks will call them a puff adder. They will flatten up and notice it's not striking. It's doing everything it can to try to bluff off this person, this potential predator. But at some point, it's had enough. And I'll kind of, for the sake of time, fast forward for you. But at some point, it's like, okay, I can't get away from this guy, so I'm going to fake my death. They actually feign. Their body goes into this state, uh, literally, where it's almost temporarily paralyzed. Their mouth flies open, and it works most predators see this and they back off. Believe it or not, they will not consume. I mean, look at that. It looks like it's dying at, that, at this point. Mouth wide open. You would think, I've just killed this poor snake, right? It is not a good scenario. It's gone. And uh, if you give it a minute, um, uh, let's see. I was thinking this video shows it, it doesn't. But it, uh, it wakes back up and, and they goes off. It's just like playing possum in our mammal world, um, except the hognose snakes can do this. So there's been a few papers published. Um, and when people get bitten by them and they let them stay latched on for several minutes, there's a lot of swelling. There's a lot of edema, um, and, and it, it, it takes some people maybe as much as three months to recover um, as far as the, the damage to their skin. There's no muscular issues. There's no neurological issues as we see with our truly venomous snakes. This is more of almost a localized skin reaction. Uh, basically think of the worst bee sting you've ever had and it, the, the symptoms persist for about eight weeks. And that's what happens with the hognose snake. Um, okay, so, oh wow, we get into some of our snakes. They're absolutely, uh, absolutely gorgeous. If you look at this snake, it, its uh, scientific name, Abicura, actually means abacus. And it gets the name because on its belly, 
it looks like the abacus that we all use to count with. Um, gorgeous red, red uh, colors within there. This is a snake along with, right, uh, our rainbow snake that we're seeing declines in. And the big problem here is what I mentioned before, our snake fungal disease, which acts a lot like white nose syndrome in bats. The picture at the lower left, this was taken this spring by J.D. Klopfer, our state herpetologist on the coast. If you notice that snake looks like it's got giant scabs on it, and you're correct. What happens is this fungus attacks them in hibernation, just like um, bats with white nose syndrome. And it literally starts chewing up their fat reserve, just like bats in hibernation. And they get these nasty scars. It will actually disfigure their face. They typically will emerge from hibernation and last two or three weeks till they perish. Now, rainbow snakes, one of their favorite foods are American eels, and they also have a spiked tail so they can grab the eel to, to feed on it. They won't bite. That's as gorgeous as they are. You don't have to worry about them being aggressive at all, but this is a snake um, in addition to the pine snake, where we just haven't seen it in, in 30 years, this is a snake that a lot of people in Virginia are worried about because their numbers are crashing right in front of us. If this was a charismatic animal like a bald eagle, people would be up in arms uh, because their numbers are declining so fast, and it looks like it's probably snake fungal disease. Our queen snakes, we love uh, Regina septumvita. Uh, it actually means this, the seven lines. And if you look on its belly and on its sides, it looks like you've got this chocolate brown snake with vanilla stripes down it. Keeled scales, because they're going to be swimmers. Their favorite food are crayfish. As much as 90, 95% of their diet are crayfish. They produce this horrible musk or odor. Some of our snakes do. If you pick them up, they smell really, really bad. Um, pollution is their problem. Anybody want to guess why pollution is the issue with the snake? What do you think? Killing the crayfish. There you go. It's not the animal, it's their food, right? So when we see creeks that get highly impacted and you lose the crayfish, literally, um, the qu queen snakes will take fish, but the, typically their numbers drop very rapidly because they don't respond to that change in diet. So we're kind of, we're worried about those, right? Garter snakes. Uh, I bet everyone has seen a garter snake, uh, Thanophis or Talus, the, the shrub snake literally is what it translates to. They also have a saliva that's mildly toxic, but um, just like the ringneck snake, that little garter snake would have to stay latched onto you for several minutes and chew on you, and that just almost never happens. They're producing live young. The queen snake did as well, not, not egg bearing. And some of our garter snakes can produce over a hundred young, especially in the Great Lakes populations. Uh, they love amphibians, they love salamanders, they love frogs. Uh, and they're one of our first snakes to come out of hibernation. They do very well with cold temperatures. I've had them uh, in early February, even out sometimes in Northeast Tennessee. They're also one of the last to go into hibernation. Uh, so you will see those hanging out in your yards, especially if you've got a little backyard, you know, a little pond or a little creek in your backyard. You'll see those folks hanging out late, late into the season. Not to be um, confused with the ribbon snake. And a lot of folks will confuse confused, the ribbon snake, uh, Thanophis, the shrub snake, and Sertalis means it looks lizard-like, um, almost like some of our legless lizards. They're a little more aquatic than um, garter snakes, so they're going to be found typically right at the water's edge, uh, but they're very similar. They give live birth. They produce this nasty smelling musk odor that they release out of their cloaca as a defense. The way you want to tell these, these two apart is if you look, the easiest way I tell our students, underneath their eye, you'll see there are vertical lines on their scales. You see that typically there are about five lines that we see on the garter snake that we don't see on the ribbon snake, right? And th because the garter snake can have some color variation on its body too, that's typically the easiest way. The other thing that we'll see is the, the white mark in front of the eye of the ribbon snake typically is much more pronounced than it is um, on, on the garter snake. <laughs> okay, um, we all have our snake, and this is mine. So this is the northern water snake, uh, Nerodia sipidon, uh, meaning it's it's coming out from some of the mythology there. These these folks uh, are non non venomous. 
they are one of the worst snakes that I have to uh, to work with. I think I've been bitten by water snakes more than I've been by anything else. They are incredibly aggressive. They will not back down. They will keep striking at you um, until you choose to back down. The other fun thing is, and this happened in our field techniques course, which freaked all the students out. Uh, I had caught one for our students and in the process stepped into a pond. So I fell into a pond, but I managed to keep the snake up and uh, we saved the snake. Uh, but the whole time it's biting me as I fell into the pond. They have an anticoagulant in their saliva. And actually medicine, uh, they, you know, pharmaceutical companies have looked at this as a way to potentially look at treating blood clots in humans. You get bitten by one, you'll bleed for several minutes because the saliva, until it's totally gone, um, it's going to keep, keep your blood flowing. But again, they also have the placenta and are providing uh, nourishment to their developing young. In fact, they, are, they have an extensive uh, nourishment being given to the young um, that are inside them. And she can have up to 100 young which is nice. But most people that have a bad experience with the snake in Blacksburg in our area, it's going to be a water snake. They'll often think they're dealing with a venomous snake because these snakes are so aggressive. And, uh, and again, they, they, they typically don't back down very easily. So my advice for most people is just kind of avoid the northern water snakes because they're, uh, they're I'll, I'll be honest, copperheads don't do this, but copperheads are easier to pick up than, than northern water snakes. Speaking of copperheads, so we finally have changed families. We're now in the family Viperidae, and uh, this, this is our viper group. These are the pit vipers. They have hollow fangs, the vertical pupils. When we say stout-bodied, you know, a lot of people will say, I, I think I saw a venomous water snake. You know, even our thicker northern water snakes, one that's four feet long, might be, you know, an inch and a half in diameter. If you see a timber rattlesnake that's four feet long, you're going to remember it because it is extremely girthy. These things are incredibly thick. Um, even the copperheads are, are fairly girthy for their size. The vertical pupils are the key. You know, a lot of people will say, Kevin, I appreciate that, but I don't plan on getting close enough to look at its eyes. And I, I, and I agree, you probably shouldn't. The other thing is, if you look at their shed skins, look at their cloacal opening on their tail. All of our non-venomous snakes Below that cloacal opening, they have a divided scale, what we call, basically there's two scales that meet, that come across. On the venomous snakes, that stays one. So if you find a snake skin in your backyard, in your barn, go to the tip of the tail and look, and that could tell you if you're dealing with a venomous species or non-venomous in Blacksburg. Don't do that in, um, in South America or Central America, but, but here it will work, will work quite well. And again, these, these folks had bad, bad reputation because uh, not to sugarcoat it, if you do get bitten by one, it is not going to be a pleasure, uh, a pleasant experience. So a kistrodon, uh, crotortix, and a kistrodon, we're talking about their fish hooks. And their, their fangs get that name because basically you know, when they're going into you, it's like a fish hook. The good news is about 40 to 50 percent of all uh, copperhead strikes are what we call a dry strike, meaning they choose not to waste that venom on you. Now use that waste appropriately. They realize how large you are. They can get that sense from you. And if they waste the venom on you, they can't use that venom on a, a mouse or a chipmunk that comes by that they could eat. So a dry strike is still dangerous. Anything that penetrates your skin, you can risk infection or other things. But it, if you do get bitten and don't show signs pretty quickly, you can kind of take a deep breath thinking, oh boy, it chose not to envenomate me, which is nice. The biggest problem with copperheads, especially this time of year, cool mornings. They don't want to move very well because they're, they're cool. And they blend in extremely well with dry leaves and dry pine needles. And one of the problems with copperheads, a lot of people step on them. Um, and, you know, I have stepped within inches of them in forested areas numerous times and they've never bothered to strike at me. Each time you always kind of catch your breath for a minute thinking, oh, my goodness, once you realize it. Uh, but the problem is when you do step on one, as a lot of animals, would, if you stepped on your, you know, your cat's tail, it, it gets a little aggressive at times. Uh, but they're producing the live young and the live young have those yellow tail tips. Now, an interesting observation, I looked this summer, we were out doing some of our snake work, we really kept an eye on this because of the cicadas that we had, you know, as those of you in the Blacksburg area, you know, we had a large, uh, a large year for our cicadas. There's been some really cool observations of copperheads, young copperheads climbing trees at night in the summer and feeding on sh freshly molted cicadas. They're very soft at that point. We've all seen, you know, the cicadas when they climb up out of the ground and they emerge out of that um, out of that exoskeleton. They're soft until they harden up and they love them. 
And so that observation was first made a couple years ago. And now in July, in a lot of southern areas, people go out at night and you could find young copperheads climbing trees and they are actually eating the young cicadas off the tree. Now, we don't know if that's something that's never been observed before and only we you know, just now saw it or have they truly learned a new feeding method and we're starting to see this in copperheads now. So keep your eyes open for copperheads eating uh, cicadas. All right, our cottonmouth. And I, you know, uh, a kestrodon piscivorous, it, it meaning that it eats fish. I put that range map on there. Look at the, the locations of Virginia. Only our warmest, our southeastern portion now with climate change, are they going to move? Probably. Um, but they're nowhere near Blacksburg, right? And and we get reports, you know, people, again, they're seeing a large snake at, at Crater Lake. And, you know, I, I saw a cottonmouth. They're not here yet. Um, they get the name because when they're threatened, they open that mouth and it's real wide on the inside. And, it, you know, it's kind of there to, to back people down and, and kind of uh, keep people from uh, or keep predators from coming at them. It's kind of a warning symbol. They can be, a, they often will back down, but at times if you if you corner a cottonmouth, it will scare you a little bit. It will definitely uh, try to hold its ground uh, once it's made the decision to do so. But again, don't worry about those now unless you choose to visit the southeastern part of the state. And lastly, uh, Crotalus horridus, the rattler that's horrible, uh, which is kind of a, I think is a, a bad name for them. I, I think rattlesnakes are pretty amazing. Uh, every time I'm around one though, I, you know, you, you can, you feel your heart rate just picks up. There's something about hearing that noise. I don't know. Has anybody heard one in the wild before? When you hear that noise, it's hard for your heart rate not to kind of pick up and you don't get, you know, get excited about them. Um, couple different color phases. There's a, a lighter color phase, a darker color phase. Some of that has to do with elevation too. We often find the darkers can be a little higher because they warm up quicker uh, as those higher elevation temperatures are a little cooler. Some conservation concerns. They're 10 years old before they typically reach maturity. So they have to live to be 10 before they ever start to reproduce. They can sometimes go two to three years between reproductive events. They have um, live young too, which is which is we've you know we've said is a good thing. But here's the challenge: they move to their den sites, and they can move over four miles and share one den in a four mile area. So when someone who's wanting to do harm to rattlesnakes finds the den, and they kill the snakes in the den, they literally could take out a three to four mile area of all the rattlesnakes in that one effort. Um, so conservation wise, that that's a challenge. Now again. I would, you know, if there was one right now in my backyard, I, my daughter's nine years old, I would be nervous. I would be very nervous. I'd be worried about my dogs. Um, if you've got them, you've got, you've got to be smart. And there's things you can do with landscaping. There's things you can do with the way you're going to keep brush and vegetation around your house to help reduce that. It is possible to live with rattlesnakes, but the problem is it takes effort and it's, it's not easy. And, you know, a lot of people don't want to go through that effort and a lot of people are, are still nervous. But I would argue that it is an extremely valuable snake uh, to our ecosystem and we really should do what we could to preserve it. Um, you know, a lot, there are a lot of pharmaceuticals that are derived from snake venom. Um, and, you know, we don't know down the road future wise what there could be. The interesting thing is my move from Southwestern Virginia from the Abingdon area to Blacksburg, the one highlight of that, well, there's been many highlights. So I obviously coming to tech was a highlight, but there are many more rattlesnakes in this area. Uh, in Southwest, my area of Southwestern Virginia, they have almost been extirpated. Um, you know, I've spent uh, probably six days a week in the summer for seven, eight, nine years studying salamanders on White Top Mountain, and you never saw a single rattlesnake. Uh, and there are places now, um, our Mountain Lake Biological Station, every time I'm there now, we're seeing rattlesnakes, if you know where to look. Um, so th that's kind of been exciting for me. But at the same time, you know, you, you're a little more cautious when you're hiking and, and walking through the woods. So I think, yeah, that's... That's it. I hope I didn't go too long. It's snakes are so exciting. It's hard not to talk about them a long time. How about, do you have specific questions for me? Um, anything about what we talked about? Uh, again, we would love, absolutely love to have your help when we start to kick off our pine snake project in the spring. We would absolutely love to have the master, master naturalist involved in helping us spread the word and, you know, and helping us kind of keep an eye open for, uh, for pine snakes and hope that we can rediscover those again in, in Virginia. And I can stop, let me, I can stop sharing my screen. There we go. Uh, any questions about 
I just we might want to at, pick. If we were up at Fenwick Mines, whereabouts would we look for <laughs> try to find the pine snakes? That that is the uh, that's the vernal pools up there. Oh wow wow. Um, you know, I, I'll be honest. The the, um, the last official record was a road kill in '89, and we actually went to the top top of the mountain above Fentwick, which was that incredible four service road to get up there. It was it was pretty rough to climb to get up there. The state herpetologist and I were up there in in July. We don't know the habitat um, towards the bottom actually looks the best. Actually, along the trail system there in in the old kind of where they have the little interpretive trail that habitat looks really good um if you see one it's probably going to be accidental uh literally to the point where something is going across the road and you're like oh it's a snake and you look at that and go oh wait a minute that's kind of that whitish black looking snake that kevin was talking about that might be one and if so you know, obviously if you can safely get a picture of one get a picture if you find one dead in the road uh, that's how the, the last one came about you know obviously if you can safely get it, uh, that would be great and let us know about it. But um, we hope to do, you know, we can coordinate with you and with the Forest Service to do, if the, if the group would like to do, we can do a, an, you know, kind of an exploratory hike in that area, especially early in the summer to see if we could track some down. We've got fiber optic cameras. One of the things is they, they're in these kind of cavities under dead stumps. So we're going to be able to fit these cameras down in there to start looking around to see to also if we could potentially just luckily happen to run into one. Early on, we think it's pretty much going to be a needle in a haystack, uh, because if they were abundant, we probably wouldn't have gone 30 years without a record of one. Right. <laughs> but oh, I really you. believe they're still there. Are you going to put well, me Kevin, as soon as we can, it would be really wonderful to. Oh, oh, sir, are you still there? I'm here. Okay. <laughs> uh, it would be really great as soon as we can to plan, you know, a field trip into Fenwick Mines, because some of us have gone up there and some of us were like Judy and Mac and, and, and other people to look for vernal pools. But it would be great to go up there and, and, and be, have, have a guide like you. That would be wonderful. And, you know, again, we've gotten that, the, Sam just got that hognose snake there a few weeks ago, gorgeous hognose. So uh, even if we don't, uh, even if we don't get a, a uh, a pine snake, which, you know, that the odds of that aren't, but there could be some good things. And especially once we get our cover boards and once we get our fences going, that would be great. But I'll reach out to you and we can look at some dates, right. maybe uh, late right. June uh, next summer to do one. That would be perfect. That and somebody asked for a um, Blacksburg salamander picture. I would be more than happy to, I can email the group uh, probably tomorrow, a Blacksburg salamander picture. And if you happen to see that crawl into your basement in the next couple of weeks, please give us a call. <laughs> That's very exciting. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Hi. Hi. This is Rebecca Paulson. Um, I was in Stadium Woods yesterday and today with Carola Haas. Oh, nice. And I'm just curious if you've ever seen snakes there. I've never seen one, but I know there are salamanders. Have you looked for the Blacksburg salamander there? I don't know what its habitat is, but it would be interesting to know if it was there so uh we've seen snakes in uh, center woods we've never seen snakes in stadium woods with there are a lot of redback salamanders in stadium or uh, stadium woods and my goal uh the students that are helping me i want a picture uh, and we're not going to stage it it's got to be real i want a picture of a blacksburg salamander from stadium woods where we can put it on a log and in the background we've got lane stadium i think that would be the ultimate uh picture we have looked we haven't found one we have a suspect um, from um, Center Woods on Virginia Tech's campus that I, I got last week. Uh, we have a small piece of tissue from it and we'll run the DNA. Uh, it's, it's, it's borderline. Um, they can look a little like a redback salamander. Some of the really nice ones. And when we, you know, typically areas that are very karsty. So if there are sinkholes, if there are rock outcrops, uh, we have a site of ours that is near a very famous rock formation here in Blacksburg that uh, we get really nice Blacksburg salamanders there. So anybody that's, if you've got some rocky areas, there's a good chance you could have Blacksburg salamanders. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the picture. I think that'd be great for everybody to see. Yeah, I'll make sure and, and email some of those out uh, so that you have those to take a look at. How do you, you tell Kevin. the difference between a redback and a Blacksburg? 
So uh, the, the key thing is the Blacksburg salamander where it's in the whirlies, it's going to, on its back feet, it's going to have a lot of webbing between the toes, like an incredible amount of webbing. Uh, the other thing is that they'll look more like a lead back, red back face. So they don't have the red. They have a lot of black and white spots, um, tiny spots. They're not like a big slimy salamander down their back and typically a lot of white on their sides. And sometimes they get a little bit of red and orange spotting. And as you move closer to Dixie Caverns, where we have the Dixie salamander, which the two are very, very similar, they get more red on them. So we're trying, we think we have an area near, um, is it McDonald Mill? Am I saying that correctly? We have found an area where on one side of the road, we have Blacksburg salamanders and on the other side of the road, we have Dixie salamanders. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to figure out the road, they do not, not cross the road. So genetically, they're, something's happening there. We're trying to figure out where that boundary is and, and how we can actually tell groups like yourself and future field guides how you know it's a Blackburg, Blacksburg salamander and it's not the Dixie salamander. So uh, it's a long project and a lot of genetics, but uh, right now we need animals and pictures and little pieces of genetic material for them. Hello, I'm yes. Bill Open, Gary. Um, I might add, ETSU graduate, 1963. Oh, nice, nice. But uh, what do they do with the Burmese python after they uh, draw it in? Um, so there are restaurants now in Miami where you can eat them. Uh, <laughs> they make uh, all kinds of purses and belts and every. They are uh, the problem is so bad they are they are euthanized uh, most of the time on the spot. Um, we are seeing declines in medium-sized mammals in the Everglades, uh, raccoon size, bobcat size. When the pythons invade, you can map the invasion. Uh, the number of raccoons in the area and number of bobcats drop by 99%. Uh, they basically wipe them out that quickly. So it's a very urgent uh, attack. If you look at the models, because of urban islands, you know, they, basically, is that the snakes do very well around people because we have food, we have rats, we have cats, we have small dogs, and we have warmth. The models actually show now it's a long time, but uh, in the next 50 years, Burmese pythons could potentially make it all the way to Charlotte, North Carolina, using urban islands. So they've got to get it under control, and at this stage, they are doing everything they possibly can do, and are still losing the war against Burmese pythons. Um, right. it's, it's frustrating. Um, and it's affecting birds. It's affecting everything. You'll get it there in the Florida Keys. There's an endangered wood rat that uh, its future is, is not good because of lots of things, rising sea level, climate change, loss of habitat. And now you throw in this invasive, uh, predator that was, I mean, it was literally a Burmese Python is the Everglades is its perfect habitat. And the fact that it got in there now, you know, it can swim a mile underwater without ever surfacing. So um, it, really, the hope is they can control it. Well, the, I, the day that comes that you totally remove Burmese pythons, I don't think that's ever going to happen. They're having contest hunts even, and still they just, it's, it's you remove one and there's 10,000 that take its place. What controls it in its native that's a lot, a lot of good predators, you know, a lot of predators in its native environment. In South Florida, alligators at, seem to do okay, but the problem is um, there aren't enough, this is a bizarre statement, but there aren't enough alligators to keep the uh, Burmese pythons in check because their numbers have gotten so incredibly large so quickly. The man-made canals that people have dug to help with transportation acted as highways. So once the initial invasion, and there's all kinds of theories, did people let go of pets? Was it hurricanes that destroyed a warehouse that was storing pet Burmese pythons? Um, but they hit those canals and they've dispersed. And, you know, there's rock pythons. It's just not Burmese pythons. Rock pythons are in Miami now. And those things bite. They're not venomous, but they, they can do a lot of damage to somebody. So they're tracking rock pythons now. South Florida has become its own living zoo, basically, for her herptofauna. The coolest thing in South Florida, if you're into herps, is track down an avocado farm. Uh, and if you get into some of the rural areas in, in southwestern Florida, and uh, you know, you can tell the owner, can I get, I'll give you 20 bucks, can I go? And they know what you're doing. Uh, yeah, good luck. And you can go get all the chameleons you want 
uh, because chameleons have escaped and they, for whatever reason, love avocado farms. So um, yeah, it, all kinds of chameleons now that live in South Florida. <laughs> It's a mess. I have certainly enjoyed speaking with you. This has been wonderful. I hate to run. I have a study session at 830. Um, one of, some of our, our principals of Fish and Wildlife course, they have their midterm exam tomorrow. And I've got a bunch of students that are wanting to hear from me about uh, a review session. But this has been wonderful. I look forward uh, over the next several years working with you. Again, I had a great relationship with the Holston Rivers chapter um, in Abingdon. And um, I would be so excited to get in the field with you and, and bring you into some some of our projects and work collaboratively because, you know, a lot of these things, trying to find these rare animals, it's just like finding rare birds. The more eyes you have out there looking for it, the better chance you have of seeing some of these things. So um, I would appreciate it. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you.